Well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, this uh, is the next 30-minute session that will take us up to half past three when we have the show and tell in here from the Children's Day. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce Ian. Uh, he's been um, machine learning for more, more years than, well, more years than most of us put together, I suspect. Uh, he also runs uh, Pi Data in London, and he's here to tell us everything we might want to know about the Scikit-Learn package. So, welcome, Ian. Blimey. Okay, thank you very much. Set my timer off. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, it sounds like you can hear me. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so I've got quite a lot to talk about here, and I can't see it on here, only on here, so I'm going to be darting around. Um, so that was quite a tall introduction that I had there. I've got a lot to live up to in this. Um, I'm going to try to introduce uh, a machine learning cl uh, classification task using scikit-learn, standard library in Python, uh, and give you a practical walkthrough all in 20 minutes. And I've been trying to compress 10, 15 years worth of knowledge into this 20 minute talk, and it turns out it's really quite hard because there's quite a lot of stuff. It's quite a rich field. So I'm going to see how I go. This is the prototype of my talk. I intend to give this at a couple of other user groups. So you are my guinea pigs. I'm experimenting upon you, and we're going to see how well we do. And if it turns out there's too much material, you tell me in the bar later, and then I can refine it. Um, so I'm an engineering data scientist. There are kind of two types of data scientists. There are the PhDs with a, a long math background, maybe physicists, and there are engineers who uh, came up via coding. Uh, I'm that type. Um, I also run, uh, in the bottom right corner, Pi Data London. So this is a community uh, in London uh, of almost 4,000 data scientists now. We have 200 people meeting every month uh, in a hedge fund. It's a free event. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge meetup, fully sponsored, beer, pizza, the whole thing, a couple of uh, talks every month. Um, and we've been building this up for three years. And we've got a nice mix of data scientists there, PhDs, non-PhDs, engineers, the whole thing. Uh, so if you're interested in, in this general field, then uh, have a look at the Pi Data communities. Uh, there are more springing up through Europe and the US all the time. Um, I also run a consultancy, Model Insight, uh, that's a couple of years old, based on consulting over 10 years. So I've seen lots of different client problems. Um, and I authored a book, which I guess some of you might have got uh, in the signing session we did earlier on. Um, one thing I've been doing in my data science career is coaching other teams. I've been around for a long time, I've got a lot of experience, so I've been helping junior teams who lack a senior leader in a team to try to get their data science uh, capabilities um, evolved a bit more. That's been really interesting and really illuminating, getting to, uh, getting, trying to figure out what it is that the teams are lacking and how that they, uh, they need to evolve their skill sets. And one observation I had along the line was that as an, an ex-engineer, I was used to getting hold of the data, cleaning it up, doing SQL, doing whatever I needed, and then doing, say, machine learning on top of it. People coming out of academia without an engineering background may expect to have the data provided in some shape or form, and then be a bit surprised when they're in an organization where they're just told, oh yeah, there are databases, you go and figure it out. So that kind of led to this insight that there are many engineers who have access to the data, but don't necessarily know how to use it in a machine learning context. So. I have a hypothesis about at least some of you, that you are engineers, you want to do some machine learning, um, and you are interested in learning how that might work. So tell me, am I right? How many of you are engineers who are interested in machine learning? Would you just put your hand up? Yes, excellent, right, good. There's some, some of you there. So I didn't get this uh, hypothesis totally wrong. So we're going to cover, um, and you know, this hypothesis is based on talking to a lot of my members at PyData, but we're a different audience, right? So maybe, maybe I got it wrong, but I didn't, that's good. So we're going to talk about a two-class classification problem. So um, is, uh, is the data of type A or type B? Is it spam or is it ham? Is it, uh, a, should we tag this thing um, as if it was a, uh, is this tag about a job on this, uh, this bit of data, or is it about a, an article of news, or is it about a sports article? So different kind of tagging things. So a two-class classification problem. Um, and we're going to talk about a process to build a machine learning uh, model but from an engineering perspective. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about training and testing data uh, and just briefly cross-validation. Um, and we're going to have a couple of notes on how to debug a machine learning model as well. And this is kind of an exciting area with debugging because you're not just debugging your code and the assumptions you have about how you're solving the problem. You're also debugging the data and you're trying to find out if you brought everything together at the same time correctly. It turns out there are many dimensions that things can go wrong on, and they'll probably go wrong behind, uh, behind your back. You won't know what's gone wrong and why, and no one really talks about debugging machine models, but I figure for engineers, this is quite a common thing to think about, so I'll try to introduce uh, a little bit of this. Oh, and uh, there's a slightly inception level to this talk in that I've got too much to cover, and I'm gonna try and cover it all anyway. So, 
the slides are online in my GitHub repo. It's the, uh, my most current repo. And there's a notebook, a Jupyter notebook accompanying it. So you could get the slides and go through them again and try to fill in the gaps. And then look at the notebook. It's fully rendered in GitHub, so everything's, all the graphs are there. And then you could try and run that as well. And then if you want to go further, two years ago, there was a tutorial on the same data set. Uh, and maybe you could run through that as well. So here's this, the super high outline of the process. We're going to do some exploratory data analysis. We're going to look at our raw data. We're going to build a dummy classifier, so the simplest possible scikit-learn classifier that learns nothing but tries to make a guess anyway. That's our base case. Then we're going to build a special classifier, a random forest. Um, this is a clever um, bit of kit. Um, it should exploit the data and make predictions better than the dummy classifier. If you've never done this before and you forget the dummy classifier step, you probably end up uh, not realizing you're not learning properly. Um, so we always start with a dummy classifier and then we do a, a random forest to try and exploit our data. Then we'll talk a little bit about testing the data. Then you're going to want to find what kind of things have gone wrong in your data, and that's part of the debugging. Uh, and then we'll go round and round in circles until it's good enough. So a super quick data overview. We're going to be using the data from the Kaggle Titanic machine learning data set. Hands up if you've used the Titanic problem before. I guess a couple of you have. Good. So Titanic gives us machine learning competitions. You get a clean data set, and then you're told to predict something. So in this case, we've got uh, data about who survived and died on the Titanic ship when it sunk. So we've got uh, people, their name, their age, their sex, uh, the fare that they paid. Can you predict from that whether they survived or died? So I want a quick... Um, someone in the audience shout out, what is one of the things you might expect that gives you a higher chance of survival if you are a passenger on the Titanic? Lots of people, right. So if you're a yeah, rich woman, that was one, right? Um, age, if you're young, there's a better chance of surviving. Um, if you're in third class and you're a man, you have a very low chance of survival. Um, so there are some things that we know. Uh, we have human level context about this. The machine has no context. It knows nothing about this. We're going to try to get it to exploit these patterns. Uh, Catherine gave a talk on data cleaning earlier. Almost always, all of your data is in a rubbish state. You haven't got enough of it, it's got holes in it, it's missing data, it lies, it actively works against you. I'm not going to touch that here. It's glorious that I haven't got to talk about this. Catherine talked about this, and Nick, uh, in the talk before lunch as well, talked about this. You should go and uh, listen to their talks and look at Catherine's book for that. So, exploratory data analysis, visualizing data, and that's the simplest possible thing. A bunch of you will have heard of matplotlib. It's the standard graphing package in Python. It's great, but it's a little bit hard to use. And if you're using it with pandas data frames, that's that thing there. Um, then matplotlib kind of works, but it's, uh, you have to write a lot of lines of code to get it to even draw a bar chart. Seaborn, SNS here is the short form. Seaborn is a library that builds upon matplotlib and lets you do really rich interrogations of your data, kind of, pardon me, um, tableau-like interrogations of your data um, in one line. So we can ask the, of the data, Look at the survived columns, this column of data with people who lived and died, ones if they lived and zero if they died, and give me a count plot. So count the number of zeros, count the number of ones. And we get that count plot. We can see that the majority of people, the blue, they died. So two thirds of the people died, one third of the people survived this ship disaster. Um, that doesn't tell us a lot, but it's, it's the beginnings of something. Then we can uh, ask uh, one slightly more nuanced question. Let's get a point plot. So uh, let's have a look at one extra dimension of our data. Let's compare the sex, so males and females, as recorded in the, in the, the log of this, uh, against their survival rates. And it turns out men typically died. 20% of men survived, so the ones averaged 20%. Um, the majority of the uh, of men's survived column is zero, 80% are zero. So 80% of men died on the ship um, when it went down, um, whereas women, 75% survived. So we've, just with one bit of information, this sex column, we have suddenly a bit of predictive information about who might survive and who might die. And then we can start digging further in, and Seaborn gives us these really rich, interesting plots. We can start to do box plots um, and multi-dimensional plots looking into our data. I'm not going to cover this anymore. If you want to look into this some more, have a look at the slides and look at the notebook. Um, and I'll put the link up again at the end. So now we've got to think a bit about how do we do this? How do we use uh, this data in a machine learning context? Um, and that's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And this is really, there's kind of a whole academic course packed into this one slide. So I'm just going to give you the super highest level overview. We're going to have features and a target. Features are the things that you're learning from. The target is the thing you want to learn. The thing we want to learn is whether somebody lived or died. So is that survived column a one or a zero? So that's the target. And this X and Y, this is just standard terminology. Everyone talks in terms of X and Y. 
So Y is a list of ones and zeros. Did they live? Did they die? Uh, features X, these are things that we could learn from. So the person's uh, age, uh, their sex, um, which class they were, and other such data. Um, so we've got these features, we've got this target, we can learn from it. And we'll look at some examples in a moment. We need to split the data into training and test sets. It's very important in machine learning that you have at least two sets. One that you learn from, the training set, and one that you test from, the test set. It's a little bit like having an exam. If I gave you an exam paper and said, tomorrow, you're going to have an exam. Today, you're going to practice off this exam paper, and these are the answers. It's kind of like, that's the X, and that's the Y. And you're going to sit there, and you're going to practice. You're going to go through this exam paper and keep on checking the questions that you've got. You work out your answers. You compare to the real answers. You go round and round until you're really happy that you look at the question, and you get the correct answer. You're a really good pattern uh, detection machine. You've learned a perfect pattern correspondence there. If I then said, the next day, you come into the exam, Here's your test paper. You look at it and go, oh my goodness, it's the same paper I had yesterday. I know these answers. It's amazing. You're going to get 100% score. It doesn't necessarily mean you've learned anything at all about the problem domain. It might just mean you've memorized all of the answers. And so we get the same problem with machine learning. The machine's really good at exploiting the information it can memorize rather than learning underlying patterns. So we have to make a training set and a test set. And a couple of lines of scikit-learn code give us this training set and this is test set. So now we're going to do the simplest possible thing that we can do in scikit-learn. We're going to say, if I give you no data at all, and I ask you to predict, did somebody live or did they die, how well might you do? Now, we know that approximately two-thirds of the people on the boat died. So if you know nothing about a person, no attributes of that person at all, we've got no features to learn from, we can always guess, oh, that person died. So if I give you 200 people and say, did they live, did they die? Oh, actually, they died, they died, they died, all of them died. And you'll be right, two-thirds of the time. Hooray, more than 50%, right? You're right, two-thirds of the time. You haven't learned anything, of course. You're just exploiting the underlying data uh, and not learning a single thing. But this is our base case. So we've learned there uh, that we can predict 62% of the time correctly. So no, no machine learning exploitation. We're just using the, uh, the target in the data. Um, can we do better by introducing features and using a cleverer classifier? So we're going to use a random forest. This is a clever classifier. It's, it would come kind of halfway through a course. I'm not going to tell you anything about how the classifier works. All that we care about is that it's a clever classifier, and it's got some really good features around it. So there's a bunch of things there that I'm not going to discuss right now that mean that it's very powerful, and it can exploit your data in various ways, and probably it won't go wrong. And that's really important. Not going wrong is incredibly important. If you want to understand this, really, you've got to go and do a course on it. But you can exploit this if you've got your own data set and it kind of fits the mold of what I'm talking about here. You should be able to exploit this in a sensible way on your own data to begin to do some machine learning and get some predictive power. So we replace the, uh, the line bringing in the dummy classifier that we had a minute ago with a random forest classifier. You can see that this, uh, the scikit-learn interface is really simple. It's very consistent. We train it up on our training data, so we give it the X, the features to learn from, Y, the target, whether somebody lived or whether they died, and we do a fit, so this is training the classifier, and then we ask it to score on the testing data. Previously, we got a score of 62%, now we get a score of 78%. We've learned something, this is amazing. The machine has learned to generate some very simple rules inside this random forest classifier, but it's exploiting the, uh, the, the question, is the person a man or a woman? And by exploiting that, Using that graph that we saw earlier, we've got very different survival rates for men and women. It can predict far more, uh, far more better than it could do uh, without that information whether somebody lives or dies. So we get uh, this 78% um, prediction, um, which is pretty good. It's not great. We're using one bit of information, but it's pretty good. Uh, and we get this thing called a confusion matrix. We can begin to say, for the people on the left axis, the true labels, of the people who did die, how many did the classifier think actually died? And it says, well, 140 who did die, the classifier thinks died, and of uh, a remaining 28 who did die, the machine thought they survived. So we got 28 wrong in that case, so you know, that's not brilliant. But on the survived, the top right, we get 71 who did survive, the machine thinks they did survive, so that's pretty good. But also 29 who did survive, where the machine thought that they died. What you want to see is strong numbers on those diagonals, so it gets the, cor the correct predictions correct, and then the ones on the other diagonal, when it says they survived and they died, and vice versa, you want the smallest possible numbers. And we get to that by adding more information. Now, it's very common that you add some more information, like here we're adding two features, so uh, is female and P class, so the, the class of the person. We think the class might help her and predict if they're upper class and lower class, maybe they survive at different ratios. Turns out the answer is exactly the same. 
This is one of the annoyances in machine learning. You add some more data, you think you've had an insight, you put it in, you get really excited, and then the answer's the same or worse. And then you get this emotional high, down, and then it gets really bad, then you get really upset, and then you try again, and you try again, and you try again. And in the end, you figure out a way of making things a little bit better, and you slowly drag yourself forward, and you slowly make your classifier better. So it's very normal to make things not better or worse. Uh, and it's hard to make things truly better. Um, but you will get there um, given a, a slow engineering, clear mindset, adding in data in a very sensible way. With scikit-learn, one thing it won't do is accept any columns that have missing data. So we want to use the age column. We think maybe the older a person is or the younger that they are might change the likelihood that they survive the disaster. The age data set has some missing data, so that left column there, we see a NAN on row five. NAN is not a number, it means it's missing. We, don't, we just don't know how old that person was. We can't lie, we can't make something up, we just don't know. The random forest classifier is particularly robust to it if you treat it in a certain way, and that certain way is just changing that column, changing that NAN to be a sentinel value. So you just put in a marker that just says, basically, this is a number, like all the other numbers, but it's a number that's totally different to all the other numbers. Ages are always positive numbers. You can't be a negative age. So we put in this minus 100. It's a marker that scikit-learn is happy with, and it can then learn and start to exploit this age data. So if we then build a new classifier with, in this case, I've added a bit of string manipulation, looking to see if somebody's a mister or not. Um, I've used that age that I just generated, some family size and some other information. All of a sudden, then, our classifier starts to get better. It gets a few percent better. We can see that our died, died corner is 149 up from 140. So we've got nine more predictions there correct. Uh, and then we've gone, I forget what we had under survive, but we're up to 72. That's a few more better as well. That means that the other diagonal, we've got a few more of those that we were getting wrong before. We get less of those wrong. So overall, the classifications are getting better. So in just a couple of lines, adding just a couple of features, we're making a classifier that's incrementally getting better. Now, how do we go about debugging these kind of things? And that's really quite a tricky question. The confusion matrix we've looked at, you just want to be looking at that and saying, well, does this make sense? Is it the case that these numbers that I'm looking at, you've got to get into your data? Do these things feel sensible? So this is a first way of debugging my, my model. Um, does everything make sense to me? Uh, Cross-validation is something that I should have talked about, but I haven't got time. So I'm going to give you a super simple analogy. If I give you that exam paper, and you do a bit of testing yourself, and then the next day you have a fresh exam paper and you get a certain score, that's a pretty good estimate as to how much you've learned in that domain. But maybe you had a good day, maybe you had a bad day, maybe those questions just suited your knowledge or your understanding of language or whatever. What if instead you had three different exams driven by three different teachers and three different subject sets, sorry, three different lesson sets on the same subject? So you were taught the same thing in three different ways by three different people with three different styles and given three different exams, and the score you took away was the average of those exams. If you've got that, you've got a much better estimate as to how well you really understand the area. And that's what cross-validation is doing. We look at the data in different ways, and we learn on it in different styles and take an average of those different scores, and then we get a much better, much more robust estimate as to how well our machine learning is doing. We can look at feature importances, so which of the many columns we put into this thing are actually really important, and that's the diagram on the right. So fair is very important. For whatever reason, fair is extremely predictive of whether somebody lives or they, they died. If they paid very little money or no money, then they're probably in third class, there's a good chance they died. If they paid a lot of money, there's a good chance, I don't know, they bought themselves onto a boat, who knows. But they have a good chance they survived. So it's a great uh, feature that predicts the outcome. Um, all the way through to the uh, is Mr. feature, which is of very low importance. It turns out it adds a small amount of predictive information, but only a small amount. And it's quite usual to get features that have got zero value as well. And those, when you've got zero predictive value, there's no point having them in there. They're just noise. They're just not adding anything to your model at all, and you can get rid of them. Um, and then one thing I discuss in the notebook, if you go and look at the code, um, one thing you can ask is, of the examples you're predicting, that you get wrong, so when it says, oh, you lived and that person actually died, or vice versa, when you predict and get it wrong, how badly did you get it wrong? Because actually behind the scenes, you don't just get a one or a zero, you get a probability. So you get a, like a 99% probability this person lived or died. And if, if you find the ones where it got the probability maximally wrong, it said 99.9% .9 chance they lived, really they died, that's a huge error. So go and find the examples of the, uh, the classes that it got really, really wrong, and start to look at the data and start to investigate what data maybe you're presenting wrong, you're, you're not exposing enough of the data, maybe there are errors in your data as to why it's getting it wrong. And you 
use that as a debugging process. So there will be examples for that in the notebook. So I think I've actually kept to my 20 minutes, yeah? Okay, I'm, I didn't even need the appendix slides that I pushed over there just in case I didn't quite fit my time. So that's a super quick introduction. I mentioned there's this inception-like level to things here. I'm not expecting you to, if you've never done this before, I'm not expecting you to understand it in the first pass through. And that's fine. It's, you, I've been in this field for 15 years. I still don't consider that I have particularly deep domain knowledge in many of the areas. You can run this yourself. If you download the notebook that I've linked there, that Ian Oswald, PyCon UK, using scikit-learn classification, you can run the notebook that generates all of the plots and a bunch more stuff, uh, and you can run it yourself. You just need Python 3.5, Jupyter Notebooks, um, and the latest version of Seaborn. And if you use the Conda distribution from Continuum, uh, you get Anaconda and install it. You get all of that stuff for free, and it will just run perfectly. Um, so you can get the GitHub repo and go through the slides, uh, and also if you want to uh, run the notebook again. Um, when you've run the notebook and you've run it, you've modified it, you've played with some of the questions that I raise in the notebook, and you've just made sure you've gone around it and you've understood it, then you can go back to PyCon UK 2014, where we had a two-hour tutorial um, from, I think it was Edsory gave that, um, a two-hour tutorial going into exactly this data set, taking everything that I've covered in much more depth, and you can go through it in much more depth. And then maybe you go and pick up a couple of books. Certainly, if you've got to deal with your own data, you're going to want Catherine's book or one of the other books that helps you extract the right kind of data that you need to present it for a machine learning problem. And then you can start working on your own data set. Um, always take an engineering mindset and go nice and slow and easy with it. Um, and that last point, if you've got questions, I respond very well to beer in the pub afterwards. So <laughs> happy to answer questions in the pub. Um, and I've got a collection of notes that I've been building up from the coaching that I'm doing, and just generally over the last couple of years. That's on GitHub, in my GitHub account, Data Science Delivered. It's kind of a pamphlet-sized book, just a collection, a long collection of bullet point notes. Um, if you're getting into this, it covers data cleaning all the way through to machine learning, um, and you, maybe you'll find some tidbits in there that will give you uh, some ideas. So if you're interested also, uh, look online. I've got a couple of slides in the appendix on deployment and cross-validation, um, but you can get those by looking online. All right, I'll call it there. Thank you very much. That's not bad to yeah, yeah. But if uh, anybody has any questions for Ian, please for, uh, line up at the microphone, and we've got time to fit a few in. Uh, please try and keep your questions as brief as possible if, if you can. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, is scikit-learn always asking a binary um, No, decision? very good question. So scikit-learn can answer binary questions. It can answer multi-class questions where you have many different labels. Also, it can do regression where you're saying, uh, for example, given these descriptions of a job, these descriptions of jobs, what is the salary behind the job? So is it a low number, is it a high number, is it any number in between? So you can predict ranges of values in regression problems, and you can predict classification. And also in scikit-learn, you can do unsupervised um, problems. So that's where you don't have labels, and you ask it to start teasing apart your data in interesting ways to try and tell you if there's structure in your data, and you as a human have to guide that process. So there are at least three different ways you can go and investigate your data with scikit-learn. Thank you. It's a really solid package. I was just Hello. wondering, um, which machine learning algorithm does it use? Which machine, learning, uh, which machine learning algorithms do I use? So typically, I will start with logistic... I did hear you right. So, yeah? yeah. So I typically start with some uh, exploratory analysis just to look at the data and do some simple statistical questions, averages, mins, maxes, and the like. Then I'll move to something like logistic regression, which is a linear classifier which won't take uh, account of um, correspondences between features in your data set but it's really easy to debug what's going on inside logistic regression. Typically, then, I'll jump to random forest. And then, if I'm, really, if I'm competing in a competition, maybe I'll use, say, I'll start to combine different classifiers. So maybe random forests, extremely randomized trees, um, maybe a neural net, and start to combine those using ensembling techniques. That's super, it's super easy to tie yourself in knots and get it wrong and think you're being really clever until you realize you've really toasted yourself when you do that. Generally, I stick with a random forest or logistic regression because I understand them both and they're easy to do debug. Thank you. Hi there, thanks for the talk. God. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering that thing when you talk about the missing value for the random mm -hmm. forest where you set the age to be minus 100. I wasn't aware you could do that. Is there any sort of foolproof way? Because I suppose with age, that's an obvious one where you can say, yeah, that's clearly not the case. But 
I'm thinking sometimes you might enter something and it just erroneously interprets that that is the true value. And then it actually then sort of spanners the predictions that you're going on to make. Is there any sort of, I mean, is it algorithm specific as to which ones can handle these types of, well, I don't know what you call it. Right, do, so, well, it? this is, I mean, here I'm, in, this is imputation. So yeah. here I'm imputing uh, a value of minus 100 only because random forests will start to ask the question, oh, if someone's over 50, what's the likelihood that they live or die? I can make a decision about that. If someone's under 20, what's the likelihood they live or die? Oh, if someone's under zero, what's the likelihood? Oh, actually, it's like 50-50. This, I can't ask this question. It's a stupid question. I'm not even going to ask this question. So it can parse the data because it's a number, but it can't get a useful answer from it. So ignore asking that question. So random forest is interesting because you can put this sentinel value in, and it will basically not ask that question. Whereas if you use, say, logistic regression, where we've got scaling issues to start thinking about that minus 100 means something, that's a distance there, and the choice of that negative number or whatever value means something, I don't even want to get into that. That's a whole subtle, well, you know that well from the medical work. That's a whole subtle, difficult area. Okay. So, yeah, imputation is tricky. Random forest lets us set a sentinel, which means we can get away with doing something really simple and it doesn't care, it doesn't mind. Right. So, so do it if you know what you're doing and making sure... sure well, this is kind of a trick, but it only yeah. works in random, in forest, in uh, tree okay. ensemble techniques. Um, a trick that I happen to find, and I think it's a nice trick because it means without going into too much depth, I can give everyone a quick solution to filling in missing values, which probably won't shoot them in the foot. Okay, thanks very much. Right, right. well, thank you very much, Ian. I think uh, we all owe Ian, owe Ian uh, a huge thank you. Thank you. And if you, if you do have any further questions for Ian, they will now cost you a beer at the bar, I suspect. At least a beer. <laughs>